Bien, bonjour à tous, désolé pour ce léger retard. Euh, et bienvenue donc à cette nouvelle session euh, du euh, tribunal étudiant pour le règlement des différents internationaux. Um, this session is going to be held in English. Um, and uh, the theme of this session is the Greek public debt. And uh, we're going to ask the question whether the Greek public debt is legal or not. Um, as you know, the Students' Tribunal for International Dispute Settlement is a body uh, created at the Université Libre de Bruxelles a few years ago. We dealt already with the questions of the Falkland Islands, uh, Tibet, and today uh, the Greek debt. The idea is um, always the same. A body of students, part of the specialized master in international law, the advanced master in international law, is going to take the floor and uh, be the tribunal while experts from um, uh, international law are going to plead uh, the question uh, before them, in this case, the question of the Greek public debt. Um, today, we're going to have two distinguished guests um, talking about that topic. Uh, first, Antonios Tsanakopoulos from the University of Oxford is going to defend uh, Greece in that matter. Antonios Tsanakopoulos has dealt extensively with international law and has uh, been publishing uh, also on coercion uh, and economic coercion in international law, which is also one of the reasons why we asked him to join us um, today. Um, the other um, uh, speaker today will be Christian Tams. Christian Tams is now at the University of Glasgow. His work uh, extensively in public international law as well, um, and he's been also writing especially on investment disputes which um, is one of the reasons as well why he is so well suited for uh, this um, event. So the tribunal is now about to enter. I ask you please to behave as if uh, we were in a real tribunal, which is the case. Um, so the president uh, will explain to you how the session will unfold. Um, and so you will know exactly how these things are going to happen while you listen to him in a short while. So I'm going to now uh, go to the, to the door, open the door for the tribunal and, uh, and uh, please behave accordingly. Thank you very much. Mesdames et messieurs, veuillez vous lever pour le tribunal étudiant de l'Église. Veuillez vous asseoir, la séance est ouverte. Ce tribunal arbitral est aujourd'hui réuni pour entendre les plaidoiries des parties dans cette affaire concernant la légalité de la dette grecque et qui oppose la République hellénique et l'Union européenne. Le tribunal exerce aujourd'hui sa compétence propre mutu en vertu de l'article 9 de son statut afin d'examiner la conformité du Memorandum of Understanding du 19 août 2015, au regard du droit international. Conformément à l'article 12, paragraphe 3, le tribunal a commandé aux greffiers d'en informer les parties afin qu'elles puissent, si elles le souhaitent, présenter leurs observations orales au tribunal. Suite à cela, la République hellénique a nommé comme conseil M. Antonios Tsanakopoulos et l'Union européenne a nommé comme conseil M. Christian Tams. Les parties devront répondre à deux questions. Première question. Est-ce que le Memorandum of Understanding du 19 août 2015, conclu entre l'Union européenne, la République hellénique et la Banque de Grèce, est conforme au droit international Deuxième question. Suite aux circonstances actuelles, est-ce que la République hellénique doit respecter toutes les conditions du Memorandum of Understanding La République hellénique présentera premièrement ses arguments suivis de l'Union européenne. Chaque plaidoirie dont la durée sera fixée à 30 minutes, sera suivie d'une séance de questions. Le tribunal posera au Conseil toute question qui lui semblera nécessaire et leur Conseil aura ensuite 10 minutes pour y répondre. Au terme de ces plaidoiries, nous effectuerons une pause avant d'entendre les répliques et dupliques des deux parties. 
Ces répliques et dupliques auront une durée de 15 minutes. Nous pouvons dès à présent commencer. C'est donc à la République hellénique de présenter ses arguments. Je donne donc la parole à M. Antonos Tsakanakopoulos. Monsieur le Conseil, vous avez la parole. You have the floor, sir. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Monsieur le Président, Monsieur et Madame le Juge, c'est un grand honneur de prendre la parole devant votre corps aujourd'hui. Euh, je suis très reconnaissant à la République hellénique euh, pour m'avoir confié cette tâche très difficile. Vous permettez euh, de, de continuer euh, ma présentation en anglais For sure. Thank you. Mr. President, members of the court, it may indeed be an honor to appear before you um, today, but the task entrusted to me by the Hellenic Republic Um, unfortunately, is not easy at all. I have to appear before you to argue um, a very, very peculiar case, um, one that involves many years of mismanagement on the part of the state which I represent, but which also involves the collusion um, and support of many other states who profited handsomely, and not just financially, but also politically, from this state of affairs. Mr. President, members of the court, I did, not become, I did not come before you today to decry the politics of the Greek sovereign debt crisis. I came before you to argue on the legality of the Financial Assistance Facility Agreement, which I will call the Loan Agreement, and the Associated Memorandum of Understanding of August 2015. Um, essentially, both of these documents Um, are concluded, both of these instruments are concluded between the ESM, the um, European um, Stability Mechanism, an international organization, um, and the Hellenic Republic. But before I start um, my legal argument on this point, I would um, ask you to allow me to clarify briefly um, and describe the present situation of Greece um, and an assessment of how we got there. Now, the situation in Greece is truly tragic. As you know, there is significant unemployment, um, which reaches a, more than 50% among people of young age, a GDP that has shrunk very significantly over the last six, six years, approximately 30%, um, suicides, fire sales of public assets, rising taxes and falling income, um, lack of heating in schools, um, and a significant number of the population reliant on food banks. Many could say that this situation is of Greece's making, and for that reason, its people should suffer. But this is not so, or at least it's not exclusively so. It is true that for decades, Greece has been run by a close circle of political families and um, has, that have swapped places in power. Um, and these were supported by corruption and clientelism, um, which was widespread, widespread in the state. Um, This is no doubt the fault of the Greeks, who voted for them and put them in power. But the rulers were propped not only by the Greeks, but also supported um, by, their, by our partners in Europe for their own economic interests. In particular, after Greece entered into the Euro, it was, fl uh, it was flooded with cheap credit, um, which was invariably used to support the main industries of our European partners including their um, um, weapons industries, their construction industries, their telecom industries, um, and many other areas. Um, everyone seemed to be happy to be lending Greece money without checking um, where that money was spent, as long as, as it was spent on, uh, on the appropriate expenditure. Let's just put it that way. Now, when push came, came to shove, essentially when it became clear that the Greek debt Um, would not be sustainable. Um, our European partners, um, instead of recognizing their part in this whole story and working with Greece to fix what was undoubtedly a broken situation, um, decided to essentially move the private debt amassed by their banks into public ownership. And they use a particular scheme of channeling money through Greece um, through the so-called bailout packages, 
um, essentially by having Greece act as the intermediary, buying private debt and turning it into public debt, which is now income upon the European taxpayers. So essentially, public money, tax money of the European taxpayers was used to bail out the banks, the private banks, and suddenly the, people, the peoples of Europe with debt, toxic, unsustainable, Greek debt, that kept growing. Um, and in that context, they played yet another trick. And that other trick was to wage the finger, take the moral high ground, um, use the lowest possible instance, and instead of working together, opting to basically say it's all the fault of the lazy Greeks, look at them, not working, not paying taxes, sitting out in the sun, sipping on their coffee, smoking their cigarettes, and now it's all the tax money, the hard-earned European tax money that is going to bail the lazy Greeks out. So, so goes the stereotype. How could this be in the 21st century in Europe? It's not that complicated. When you really use taxpayers' money to transfer um, private debt into public ownership, then this is fertile ground for such stereotypes to take hold and for this sort of discriminatory talk to take hold. Mr. President, members of the court, the new government of Greece, which was elected in 2015, sought to break this vicious circle of bailouts and creating um, and turning private debt into public debt. Um, and it also sought to change the particular measures that were being applied in the instance, which had most clearly failed. The measures that had to be taken between 2010 and 2015, and some of which need to continue to be taken, essentially put the economy in a double dip, decimated production, they decimated the tax capacity of the Greek people, they demoralized the workforce, and they um, forced much of it to emigrate as well. And the debt was and is still rising to the detriment of both the Greek and European publics, but not to the detriment of the banks. But when the new government sought, sought to renegotiate, it was threatened with expulsion from the euro. It was threatened with the collapse of its banks. It was threatened, essentially, with ultimate destruction. And it was finally coerced, with banks closed, and it's back against the wall, into a new deal that cannot be upheld, or at least not in its entirety. Mr. President, members of the court, I will argue before you today, first, that the validity of the loan agreement and the associated memorandum of understanding, which I will also occasionally be calling MOU, if that's okay, should be impeached. Not only because they were procured through coercion, but also because their basic functioning, if not their provisions, result in violations of peremptory norms of international law, including the right to self-determination, but also fundamental human rights, such as the right to life and the right to be free from inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. But this plea for the impeachment of the validity of the agreement is not enough by itself. Otherwise, Greece will end up in an even worse situation than it was before. Your tribunal must also find that it is supplemented by an obligation to negotiate in good faith and reach agreement um, for a reasonable solution to the current European public debt crisis. I will then argue in the alternative that the agreement and the MOU, and in particular their functioning, are in breach of customary international law, which is incumbent upon the ESM as an international organization, and as such allow Greece to breach aspects of the agreement and MOU as a countermeasure until such time as the ESM agrees to renegotiate the agreement to remove the illegalities, or at least those provisions facilitating illegalities, thus offering juridical restitution in accordance with the law of international responsibility. I will finally argue that at any rate, and in the second alternative, 
The Hellenic Republic may breach this agreement and MOU without engaging its responsibility, since the wrongfulness of such a breach would be precluded by a plea of necessity as a circumstance precluding wrongfulness. Mr. President, members of the court, let me begin with the issue of impeaching the validity of the loan agreement and the associated MOU. As you're well aware, Article 52 of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, um, the um, relevant articles of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties between states and international organizations, and general international law, which reflects this provision, um, essentially voids or orders that, it, that be voided any treaty um, if its conclusion has been procured by the threat or use of force in violation of principles of international law embodied in the Charter of the United Nations. Now the argument here, or the first issue that needs to be clarified here, is what the threat or use of force means. And of course, it has been preponderant in some of the literature to associate this use of force, or this reference to the use of force, to the use of armed force, um, exclusively and in conjunction with Article 2.4 of the UN Charter. However, things are not as simple. In particular, having a look at the um, preparatory work relating to that provision and how it ended up in the Vienna Convention, it is clear that states had been split as between a broad and a narrow interpretation of this reference to the use of force. Um, and many of them argue that the reference to the use of force should be understood to include also economic and other types of force. That debate was really never finally settled. We just assume that it was settled just because nobody has really brought a claim in those terms before. So I put it to you, Mr. President and members of the court, that in fact that reference to force must be understood to encompass economic force at the very least when the consequences of the force, the economic force, are akin to those of essentially an armed attack. In fact, even Lauterbach and the ILC in general turn around in their commentary to the articles, the draft articles that eventually became the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, and drew that parallel by saying, in situations where um, the threat or the use of force has such consequences, um, has um, uh, um, particularly dire consequences, how can we differentiate this from a situation where a threat of um, famine to a nation um, or of starving the population of a state produces the same effect. Essentially, it is the effect that makes a difference here. And in fact, this was even echoed by the United Kingdom uh, representatives, the United Kingdom government, who also accepted that a flagrant, um, uh, that in flagrant cases, uh, situations of economic force being put on a state in order to conclude a treaty may amount to a prohibited use of force um, in accordance with Article 52. I have many more things to mention, um, but you will find all of, all of those in terms of the preparatory work in your judges folder, tab four. Um, in particular, the declaration after the adoption of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, um, in which, um, which was basically unopposed at the time, um, and which puts it forward that it condemns the use of all types of force, including economic, political, and other types of force, and, wasn't, and was adopted without a single state holding against it. Um, but also, I would um, point out the Friendly Relations Declaration and related UN uh, General Assembly resolutions, which with very large majorities or unanimously have condemned situations of coercion where coercion aims to obtain the subordination of the exercise of sovereign rights of a state. And here we're talking about nothing less than that subordination. If you have a look at the very first page of your memorandum, what you will see, and I will come back to that later, is that essentially Greece is forced to accept oversight or consultation, in that very nice euphemistic term, to use a Greek word, um, consultation with um, ESM organs with regards to any act of regulation or legislation before that act is undertaken in Greece. This amounts to nothing less than 
full subordination of sovereign rights. But of course, Article 52 refers to um, the conclusion of a treaty being procured by the use of force, which implies the requirement of a causal link between the threat of the use of force, um, and the threat for the use of force, and the procurement of the treaty that I'm currently arguing is void. Now, in very simple terms, being dragged into a negotiation with banks closed, banks against the wall, and a threat that on Monday the banks will simply not open, with dire consequences with respect to the ability of the country to provide food and medicine for its population, which after all needs to be imported, um, because of course neither Greece nor any other state is self-sufficient in those terms, no matter how rich. Um, I put it to you that there is a clear causal link between the use, the threat of economic force put forward by our European partners and Greece's ultimate submission in July and August 2015. Mr. President, members of the court, Greece also seeks to impeach the validity of the agreement on the basis of Article 53 of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, the relevant article of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties between states and international organizations, and customary international law. Um, I will not tire you on the provisions of Article 53, um, which are um, discussed at length also in our written pleadings, essentially a treaty is void if it conflicts with a peremptory norm of international law. And a peremptory norm of international law is a norm from which um, um, no derogation is permitted um, in accordance with the international community of states as a whole. Now, the norms that I'm referring to here, or the peremptory norms which are violated by the um, loan agreement and the memorandum are essentially first and foremost the right of self-determination of peoples. The Greek people, in the exercise of the right to inter internal self-determination, chose a government whose manifesto provided clearly for a fair renegotiation of the burdensome and ultimately failed bailout programs, and reaffirmed this mandate in the referendum of 5 July 2015. The coercion of that government into diverging from the mandate constitutes a breach of self-determination, a clear rule of use cogens, or to put it in terms, in the terms of the um, International Court of Justice, an essential principle of contemporary international law. And that is in the East Timor case. Convention, or the treaty at hand, is not only violative of use slogans in terms of internal self-determination. It's also violate, uh, violative of use slogans in terms of fundamental human rights that are being violated. And these fundamental human rights that I'm referring to here have acquired the status of use slogans norms as well. These include the right to life, the right to be free from inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment, and the prohibition of collective punishment in international law. It would take a very long time to make a case for each and every of these rights in detail, but I am happy to return to this when I um, have questions from your tribunal. The final part of um, my pleading with respect to impeaching the validity of the um, uh, 2015 agreement and memorandum of understanding relates to the obligation to negotiate in good faith. For any of this to make sense, Mr. President, members of the court, the court must find a corresponding obligation on the ESM and largely the EU to negotiate a solution to the crisis in good faith. Impeaching the validity of an agreement that offers Greece 
a vital lifeline of credit in order to maintain solvency of its banks without the obligation to negotiate in good faith and indeed reach agreement on a fair and equitable basis on what is essentially a European problem will be without point. Now, if I may, I will move to arguing in the, in the alternative um, that essentially the agreement is in violation of international law, and for that reason, Greece is entitled to breach it as a countermeasure. In order to make this point, I will have to ask for your indulgence for a few minutes when I describe the precise structure of the agreement memorandum and the working of the ESM organs currently out and about in Greece. First of all, both the agreement and the memorandum are essentially between the Hellenic Republic and the ESM, the European Stability Mechanism is an international organization established by all the member states of the Euro um, to offer financial assistance to states in distress. So we do recognize sometimes that there are states in distress. Now, this ESM, the European Stability Mechanism, um, is an international organization with a separate legal personality. Um, it has indeed also the capacity to include, to conclude international treaties. And, um, and so, essentially, um, being a subject of international law, or having at least some degree of international legal personality, that international organization must be considered as being bound by international law. And the rules of international law binding upon it may easily be found in its constitutive instrument, an international treaty, but also in customary international law. This is an international subject. It is also bound by customary international law to the extent that this is applicable to its functions. The obligations under customary international law that are indeed very applicable to the ESM's functions include fundamental human rights that go far beyond those human rights that can be considered phobias, far beyond things like the right to life um, or the um, freedom from inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. They include many other civil and political rights, but also, um, most importantly, um, some economic, social, and cultural rights, including the right to food, the right to health, the right to education, and many others. We stand here before you, the Greek government stands before you, to argue that the way that the particular agreement, associated memorandum, and when I say associated, means by means of conditionality, the agreement itself um, and you'll find that in tab two of your judge's folder, uh, basically says nothing at all except that it is subject to strict conditionality in accordance with the ESM's constitutive treaty, which is in tab one. Um, in tab three, you will see the memorandum of understanding, which also doesn't actually say very much substantive at all. Essentially, the way this whole thing works is that in accordance with the um, agreement and the memorandum of understanding, ESM organs are essentially consulting with Greek organs, by which we mean basically blocking legislation that they don't like, um, every day in Greece. So the measures you won't find anywhere in this particular document, except in very, very broad terms. The measures that stem from these agreements, that these agreements facilitate, are the measures taken ad hoc every day by the ESM organs on the ground in Greece. Why am, I say, why am I saying all this? Essentially, as you know, for any state or international organization to become responsible in international law, then conduct that is attributable to that state or international organization must also be in breach of one of uh, this international organization's obligations. We argue essentially that all acts of the Greek organs under the oversight or consultative power of the ESM organs are in fact attributable to the ESM. There are two bases for this. One of them is in accordance with Article 7 of the ILC Articles on the Responsibility of International Organizations. ESM organs, the organs of an international organization, are actually currently exercising effective factual control, in Nicaraguan terms, over all Greek organs, since they have the capacity 
to block, change, and repeal legislation. Even if you find that this is not the case, then we argue, at the very least, that Greek organs are currently under the effective normative control, at the very least, I repeat, of the organs of the ESM, which essentially means that because of the power of the agreement, because of the binding power that they can exercise with the Greek organs through the agreement and MOU, the Greek organs are deprived of any ability for autonomous acting. In either case, the acts of the Greek organs in passing measures violative of human rights, and there are many reports as to how the particular measures like raising taxes um, or um, providing for uh, banks as being uh, the preferred creditors in any situation of bankruptcy and so on and so forth, violate a whole array of human rights. Um, I can come back to this during the questions, but I can also point you to um, several analyses that you have included in your judge's folder. So if these measures are attributable to the ESM and are also in breach of the ESM's international obligations, at least under customary international law. This means that the ESM has become responsible in international law, which entitles Greece to respond by taking countermeasures. This is not only because these obligations are owed erga omnes, and so any state is entitled to respond to these, to these breaches. It is in particular because Greece is a specially affected state in these circumstances, since it is in its territory and within its jurisdiction that these measures are taking place, and it is and it is that it is with respect to its people that these measures are breaching human rights. I can also offer an alternative basis for this, and that alternative basis you will also find in the articles on the responsibility um, of international organizations. It's uh, in particular. Article 18, which refers to coercion. Um, essentially, this article does not hold the ESM responsible for act conduct that is attributable to the ESM and in violation of the ESM's obligation, it, obligations, but it essentially says that um, ESM, the ESM is allocated responsibility for the wrongful measures taken by Greece. Um, article 16 of the Articles of State on um, the responsibility of international, um, uh, of international organizations, um, <coughs> excuse me, states, international organization, an international organization <coughs> that coerces a state to act is responsible if um, first the act but for the co coercion is an internationally wrongful act or would be an internationally wrongful act to coerce a state, and second, if the international organization does so with the knowledge of the circumstances of the act. No doubt the relevant measures taken by the Greek organs are internationally wrongful acts in the sense that they violate human rights. And there's also no doubt that the ESM is very, very well aware of the circumstances of its acts. At any rate, and in the second alternative, and with this I will close, Greece argues that any breaches of this agreement or MOU um, are excluded and excused due to necessity. Necessity is a well um, accepted circumstance for giving peculiar wrongfulness under customary international law. In accordance with Article 25 of the Articles on State Responsibility, it is acceptable when it is the only way to safeguard an essential interest, which here could be said to be not just an essential interest of Greece, but indeed an essential interest of the international community as a whole. And that refers, of course, to the upholding of fundamental human rights, including economic, social, and cultural rights. Against a grave and imminent peril, a grave and imminent peril of the violation of these rights, of bank collapse, food shortages, <coughs> lack of medicine, and the destruction of a, of a state's whole economy. So the only way to safeguard an essential interest against a grave and imminent peril which does not seriously impair an essential interest of the state or state or international <coughs> organization indeed, to which this obligation is owed. So essentially what this provision does is to pitch two interests one against the other, a higher and a lesser interest. I will let you 
Mr. President, members of the tribunal, decide which is the higher and which is the lesser interest in this situation and pitch um, against each other the survival of a population and the respect for human rights and the survival of the banks. But there is a limitation in Article 25, and that is that the state, which is invoking necessity, must not have contributed the situation of necessity. And you may well say Greece has certainly contributed to its current situation. But we're not talking about necessity in 1985. We're not talking about necessity in 1995. Indeed, we're not even talking about necessity in 2005. We're talking about necessity in 2010, 2012, or indeed 2015. Necessity, after six years of implementing memoranda overseen by the Troika, overseen by what used to be the Troika, is now the ESM orbit, um, without any autonomous regulation, is the situation that we have today. Even if the government between 2010 and 2015 colluded um, in um, these bailouts and so um, colluded in the situation or contributed to the situation of necessity, history has already proven to us, and I refer to the history of the last year, has already proven to us that they could not have done otherwise anywhere. Even the one government that tried to do otherwise could not. So any contribution of Greece to the situation of necessity after 2010 should be discounted. I'm coming to the end of my argument, Mr. President, members of the court. And I thought, after giving you so much contemporary law, I should probably resort to Grotius. Because there's a hidden argument in there, too, an overarching argument, an argument of abuse of rights, a well-established general principle of international law. Grotius, in the Eurebellia Pacis, in the third book, in the 13th chapter, says, the rules of charity reach further than those of right. He that abounds in wealth is guilty of gross inhumanity if he strips his poor debtor of all um, that is his wealth. Now, I put it to you that it is time for your tribunal, for you, Mr. President, the members of the court, to show that we have moved on from the time of Thucydides, when he stated that the weak suffer as they must when the mighty do as they please. Thank you very much. Donc, je vais donc passer la parole à mes estimés collègues, qui vont, collègues et confrères, qui vont poser quelques questions. Je vais donc commencer par donner la parole à, à Madame Pinot. So I have a question about necessity. Uh, what would be, according to you, the threshold um, for the state of necessity, and what would be the end of that state? Well, the threshold of the state of necessity is, um, I mean, essentially, is the grave and imminent peril uh, uh, question. Um, so in the situation, uh, currently in Greece, I think we are quite clearly facing um, a grave and imminent peril, as was proven um, over the summer. So essentially, the, the grave and imminent peril before us is the complete collapse of the state apparatus and a complete destruction of a state's economy. Essentially, a state cannot function without banks. Greek banks have been insolvent already since 2012. They rely essentially on the emergency liquidity assistance of the European Central Bank, which is given against, against collateral, in particular Greek bonds. Um, the um, situation is such that, as the ECB has proven over the summer, it can essentially turn off the liquidity tap whenever it wants. And when it does turn off the liquidity tap, um, it effectively can force a state, can force, uh, can force state banks into closure, um, either through the imposition of capital controls or partial closure, um, to maintain whatever cash liquidity there may be in the banks at the moment, or a complete closure. Of course, an economy in today's age cannot operate without banks unless you start writing IOUs on napkins, um, which is not advisable for buying medicines from abroad. And for that reason, um, it is, uh, I put it to you, Dampinto, that it is the um, um, 
Um, the grave and imminent peril that we're facing is indeed a complete collapse of a state's economy with all the relevant consequences. Now, um, you also asked me about what the end of the state of necessity would be. Um, and um, I think it, is, um, it should be clear that the end of that state of necessity would be the reaching of a fair and equitable um, agreement on um, the partial restructuring of the Greek debt uh, in conjunction with a <coughs> support package which would not involve um, a, um, an interference in the exercise of Greek sovereign power um, to the extent that this agreement involves. That means basically complete external control over all legislation and all regulation taking place in what should be a sovereign state and a member of the European Union. Thank you. Je vais pas donc passer la parole à Monsieur l'arbitre Godard. Don't you think that the Greek government could claim a general and unilateral right of insolvency based on its sovereignty in order to suspend the payment of its debt? Thank you, Judge Godard. I would um, hate to go into domestic law analogies. States are quite different from companies or people going bankrupt, even though we do um, always hear in the context of the um, sort of nice bedtime story about the lazy Greeks, we also hear about putting your house in order um, and how running a state is pretty much the same as running someone's kitchen, um, which it isn't. Um, I would say that um, it is completely unhelpful to Greece to declare uh, bankruptcy or insolvency or anything like that um, for the simple reason that any non-negotiated outcome of this will essentially mean its expulsion from the euro and the collapse of its economy. And that is basically what we're facing. So um, I do think that the um, arguments which we, the Greek government, have put before you today um, are the ones that actually control in this particular situation and the ones that should be accepted. Thank you. What is the applicable law of the MOU? And uh, as you know, the law and agreement are under English law, so that is not a little problem. Thank you for your question, Mr. President. I'm sorry to say that the agreement that you're referring to as being subject to English law is actually the EFSF agreement mm -hmm. in 2010 and 2012. I'm currently talking about the ESM agreement of August 2015, whose applicable law is public international law as it is concluded between a state and an international organization, as opposed to the EFSF agreement of 2010 and 2012, which was essentially concluded between what is a Luxem Luxembourgian limited liability company and the Greek state. So the applicable law of this agreement and the argument that I have put before you on the basis of that applicable law is public international law. Thank you. Donc je vais repasser la parole à Madame Pinault. Yes, uh, just one last question. Uh, you mentioned uh, the fact that the acts of Greece were attributable to ESM because of the Article 7 of the ILC project. Do you have maybe a precedent or an example that would go in that direction of a state controlled by an international organization? Thank you, Judge Pinot. Indeed, I have many um, uh, such examples. So how much time do you have? Um, so let me put it to you this way. There are, in fact, a lot of examples of effective factual, factual effective control of organs of a state by an international organization in the context of UN peacekeeping operations. It's a quite different context to the one here, but it's pretty much the same principle at work. So essentially, um, troop contributing states to um, 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 the contingents by true contributing states to um, peacekeeping operations maintain or retain, let's just put it this way, um, jurisdiction, um, indeed criminal and um, um, disciplinary jurisdiction over their troops, which essentially means that even though their, troop, their troops are organs of the state um, and the state retains some control over them, but at the same time they are put at the disposal of an international organization even though they are not fully secondant to that international organization. In a sense, they are the, master, the, uh, the servants of two masters in these circumstances. 
Article 4 of the Articles of State Responsibility requires that their conduct as state organs be automatically attributable to the state. But at the same time, they're acting as organs of an international organization, or indeed as agents, if you wish. Um, and that would mean that their conduct should be attributed to the international organization. Now, the International Law Commission, for reasons that go beyond me, frankly, but that's what they said, um, essentially decided that instead of having concurrent attribution in situations like this, and I urge your court to, court to find that there is concurrent attribution, even in situations like this, but um, he, um, it argued that we need to check who has, or we need to confirm who has effective control um, over um, the uh, uh, conduct of the particular organ, so factual effective control over the uh, conduct of a particular organ in any given circumstance. And the truth is that under the memorandum of understanding to which you refer, um, all Greek organs are essentially under the constant factual effective control of the ESM organs uh, that visit Greece every, um, every week and decide on what new legislation should go to Parliament and which should be repealed. So that is one example. As to examples of normative control, I can give you the example of, um, 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 of uh, binding Security Council resolutions imposing on states um, strict obligations with respect to the um, blacklisting of certain terrorists. Um, and in those situations, the state has absolutely no discretion in, in what way to act. It is effectively normatively controlled by the international organization through that international organization's binding powers. And so the conduct in that particular instance should at least also be attributable to the international organization. So um, I hope that is enough, but I'm, of course, at your disposal, Judge Pinot, for anything further. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, you talk about uh, economic uh, force. Uh, do you think that the, the agreement 2015 was obtained um, under some uh, constraint condition? If the if uh, is the case materially, what act, acts, what concrete acts can you con can you consider as an economic uh, force or constraint? Well, thank you, Judge Walla. I think the the acts that I would consider as constituting economic force are essentially the acts of um, um, our European partners, um, the EU, the Eurogroup as an informal um, um, EU organ, um, the European Central Bank as a very formal EU organ, um, and um, uh, various other um, acts that essentially uh, put um, this whole question of Brexit on the table. Um, uh, I'm sure you know that it was in Greece who was um, putting the issue of Brexit on the table, exit from the Euro and the impending um, uh, reversion to the drachma and the subsequent essential collapse of the economy because we're going to be talking about a completely devalued currency which is incapable um, of uh, maintaining um, any sort of semblance of normality in the country. Um, if, um, and essentially what is the case here is that you're faced with a situation where you're told um, you either sign this agreement, to put it in very simple terms, you either sign this or when you return home, you basically have no banks. That is essentially economic force. Uh, it is akin to threatening an armed attack. It means you go home and there's nothing there because you basically either have to issue currency that will be immediately so completely devalued that it will be worthless um, in terms of buying anything from abroad, um, while at the time you're in a situation where your banks are completely insolvent, so you don't even have any sort of hideaway cash because you've been paying, paying it against the debt throughout the renegotiation period in a show of good faith, um, which means essentially you have absolutely no cash left. Um, and that is the reduction of a state to a situation of complete humanitarian catastrophe. And in fact, um, in your judge's uh, folder in tab 10, you will find a number of um, contingency plan um, <coughs> obtained by the Hellenic Republic, and in fact not even hidden at the time, about the impending humanitarian crisis in Greece and um, food deliveries by air. So um, I don't, if that's not economic, or if that's not the example of economic coercion, I really don't know what is. Judge Walla. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Consul. Je vais donc passer maintenant la parole à l'Union Européenne. Il y a Monsieur Christian Tams. You have the floor, sir. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, members of the tribunal, it's an honor to appear before such an august 
Tribunal today, opposite such an august colleague, and to do so on behalf of the European Union. The European Union is a staunch defender of the rule of law in international affairs. Its project, the project of peace in Europe, is the project of international law and its values, among them the protection of human rights and facilitation of cross-border cooperation, are the values of international law. As a firm advocate of the rule of law, the EU readily accepts to appear before this tribunal, even though it struggles to see that the particular matter pleaded by Greece could yield beneficial results. In fact, and I note this without any disrespect to this tribunal, we fear that the present proceedings, rather than clarifying issues, will highlight, they will heighten tensions between Greece and its European partners, and this at a time when Greece and the EU are involved in close cooperation as Greece continues its path towards economic recovery. Mr. President, members of the tribunal, this path is by no means complete. But the Greek government and its partners today are pursuing it. In this collaborative endeavor, we disagree on specific measures and their effects. Some, like the chief of the Greek Central Bank, Mr. Spunaras, predicts that the Greek economy will recover in 2016, and others disagree with that assessment. But Mr. President, and this is my key point here in introducing the EU's argument, the parties have, over the past nine months, worked and worked successfully on the basis of the financial assistance agreements entered into in August 2015. The present proceedings seek to invalidate these agreements, the very agreements that helped safeguard Greece's financial survival in 2015. And in so doing, they risk destroying the foundations of our collaborative effort, and they most certainly risk undermining the trust established between Greece and the EU since mid-2015. Mr. President, members of the Tribunal, in setting out the context to these proceedings, I am not making an argument about non-justiciability or one of judicial competence. As a defender of the rule of law, the EU believes in the peaceful settlement of disputes, and it does not dispute this Tribunal's competence. But it asks the Tribunal to resist the temptation and it's a temptation to which I feel my learned colleague may have on occasion succumbed, the temptation that all problems could be solved by invoking international law. The power of law, just as power generally, grows through its prudent use. And so the EU asks this tribunal to use international law prudently as it approaches the details of this case. Mr. President, members of the Tribunal, in light of this introductory comment, permit me to set out the EU's legal case, and it's a straightforward case built around two propositions. First, the financial assistance agreements of 2015 are valid international agreements, and second, Greece cannot unilaterally decide to stop performing them for parts thereof. Now, in addressing those two points, in turn, I will respond to my learned colleague and his claims which the EU rejects. As to my first point, Greece asserts a draconian consequence, and it's worth reiterating that this at the outset. The invalidity of an agreement that embodies a compromise reached after lengthy high-level negotiations and that form the basis of our negotiations today. International law, of course, accepts that treaties can be invalid or invalidated. However, it treats invalidity as a clear exception. And for good reason. A reason expressed very clearly in the preamble to the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, which emphasizes, and I quote, the principles of free consent and of good faith and the rule of pacta sum servanda. The international community, Mr. President, members of the tribunal, needs valid treaties if it is to function. Now, the Vienna Convention, which does not bind the parties in this case, but to which I'll refer for ease of reference as it reflects in pertinent part customary international law, lists, of course, grounds for treaties to be impeached. With respect to some of these grounds, 
my learned colleague and I are in disagreement, and I will come to that shortly. But I think there can be no disagreement about a preliminary point, and it is this. The grounds listed in the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties are exhaustive. Article 42 of the Vienna Convention, which too reflects customary international law, says so expressly. Now, if we look at the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, we see that most grounds for invalidity have no bearing on the present case. This is obviously not a case of error or fraud or corruption. Neither is this a case of a treaty concluded in violation, in manifest violation of internal law. None of these grounds helps sustain Greece's argument. So does the provision on coercion, Article 52, which was emphasized by counsel opposite. Greece's main claim, as you've just heard it, is that it agreed to the agreement under circumstances of economic coercion, and that this in itself would invalidate its consent. The EU rejects that proposition as a matter of law and of fact. We do not accept the reading that the Greek government was coerced, that is, compelled to accept a certain treaty. The idea just presented in response to your question, arbitrator, uh, uh, again. The Greek government chose between options, and this choice was a complex one. It involved considerations about the impact of Greece's potential suspension from the Eurozone, about the identification of red lines, dividing acceptable reform proposals from unacceptable demands. It involved an assessment of political support for factions within Greece, and much more. The choice made by the Greek government was a difficult one, and I would note it was a difficult choice for many parties involved in the negotiations in July 2015. But this is what choices made under dire circumstances often are. But it was a choice nonetheless, with different factions within Greece and within the Greek government advocating different approaches. So as a matter of fact, we do not accept the argument based around coercion. Now we accept, of course, that our opponents now choose to present matters in a different light, but we say that even on their construction or misconstruction of the facts, the result as a matter of law would be the same. And this is for a simple reason. Contrary to what you have heard by my colleague opposite, economic coercion of the sort alleged uh, by the Greek side would not vitiate the financial assistance agreements of August 2015. Now, international law, Mr. President, members of the tribunal, is not blind to the circumstances of a treaty's conclusion, but it limits the draconian consequence of invalidity to very narrowly defined cases, to cases involving the threat or use of military force. The EU states that this follows very clearly from the text of Article 52, which speaks of treaties, and I quote, procured by the threat or use of force. Now, I draw the tribunal's conclusion, uh, tribunal's attention to the fact that there's a conscious parallel between the terms used in Article 52, dealing with coercion and its effect on treaties, and Article 24 of the UN Charter, which bans the use of force. Both speak of force, both refer to the threat or the use, and both reserve a particular stigma to illegal uses of military force. This parallelism was plain to the drafters of Article 52. They viewed the provision as one way of translating the ban on force agreed by the nations of the world in 1945 uh, into an operational provision of the law of treaties. Now, of course, as you have heard, this analysis, the analysis I've just presented to you, has been challenged, including now by uh, our Greek colleagues. And indeed, some states at Vienna sought to broaden Article 52 by including wording that would have covered non-military, other forms of force. Academics have tried to make the case that other forms of force should be covered. But these attempts have one thing in common. They have all failed. Take the view of the dissenters at Vienna. True, some states wanted Article 52 
expressly to cover, and I quote, political and economic coercion. And true, this was put as an amendment. But equally true, and pertinently, that amendment was withdrawn. As any other course of conduct, pushing for that amendment would have, and I quote from the delegate uh, of the United Kingdom, uh, any other cause would have seriously jeopardized the prospects of producing a convention. Instead of including wording expressly covering economic and other forms of force, the Vienna Convention or the Vienna Conference uh, in 1969 adopted a resolution recognizing the unlawfulness of other forms of coercion. You will refer to this, and I'm, I'm being told it's included in tab 4, of the judges folder provided by our Greek colleagues who are better organized than my legal team, I have to admit. Um, now, the EU accepts that under general international law, non-military forms of coercion can, and can be and are indeed unlawful. For example, under the criteria spelled out by another international dispute settlement body, the International Court of Justice in the Nicaragua case. But crucially, and this is something that you have not so far heard, unlawfulness is not invalidity. The Vienna Convention, I have the Vienna Resolution I have just mentioned, which you find in tab 4, as well as subsequent resolutions, including the Friendly Relations Declaration, to which your attention was drawn a while ago, are careful not to spell out the consequence <coughs> of invalidity. This, to repeat, is a draconian consequence, which is reserved for narrow, for narrow instances, and which, crucially, resolutions decrying and criticizing the use of political and economic coercion do not refer to. Now, Mr. President, members of the tribunal, we say this is entirely right. This is the correct approach. It's an approach that recognizes the special character of military force, which international law bans, indeed bans emphatically. Since we are braced and muscles, <coughs> the Mecca for ambitious readings of the Jus Contra Bellum, I might add that, of course, even that ban, the ban on force, is subject to different and divergent readings. But in dealing with the ban on force, in construing Article 2.4 and its customary equivalent, we proceed from a shared basis, from a shared understanding. No shared understanding exists when we look at non-military force. We struggle to draw the line between influence, including forceful influence, which can be part and legitimately part of any treaty negotiation, and the undue pressure that would qualify as forcible coercion. To illustrate and to maybe take us out of debates about mid-2015 to the present date, take the present EU summit, the one taking place right now, not the Greek one, if I may <coughs> put it that way, but the Turkish one. Do we really want to re imagine the EU summit currently held reaches agreement? Do we really want to reopen discussion about an EU-Turkish deal on refugees? Perhaps because one side pressured the other into accepting a certain treaty formulation? Or think positively, think that perhaps one day the EU might accept a mandatory share of refugees coming to Europe, a project in which you, Greece and Germany uh, are jointly involved in, if we assume that such a mandatory deal, a binding agreement on contingents of refugees would be accepted, would this be the result of robust German lobby lobbying of the power of the economy? Would it, be, would it have been reached under undue coercion? Would an EU arrangement on mandatory refugee numbers imposed upon recalcitrant states in Central and Eastern Europe be invalid because it was reached under undue coercion. Now, confronted with these vagaries, the position in the Vienna Convention is very clear. And the EU's position is very clear. We say that treaties procured by illegal military force are invalid, but that other forms of coercion, the lash or real, do not affect the validity of a treaty. This approach to resume reflects international law's ban on force. It allows for congruence between Articles 2.4 of the UN Charter and Article 52 of the Vienna Convention. 
And finally, Mr. President, members of the tribunal, this approach is a realistic one, one that respects party autonomy and state sovereignty as the basis of international treaties, one that takes seriously the formally expressed will of treaty parties, and that accepts that all treaties are the product of give and take. And if I may, I would add in this case a rather dramatic give of 86 billion euros to Greece in exchange for indeed far-reaching and perhaps indeed dramatic domestic reforms in Greece. Mr. President, members of the tribunal, all this suggests that the treaty, uh, the financial assistance packages reached in August 2015 are not invalid even on the factual reading put forward by my Greek colleagues because economic coercion does not vitiate validly agreed treaties. Now, in speaking about the consequences of these treaties, I have already begun to engage with the substance of the um, agreements reached in August. Um, it was, as what made, was made clear at the time, a historic agreement that requires the parties to agree to tough compromises. Now, as you have just heard, according to Greece, these compromises are of such a nature as to invalidate the agreement, not because of the method used to reach agreement, but because of the content. Again, we say that the tribunal should firmly reject Greece, uh, Greece's claim as a matter of law and of fact. In fact, we find the normative basis of the Greek claim spurious. In support of its allegation, Greece bases itself on Article 53 of the Vienna Convention, pursuant to which treaties conflicting with norms of use covid are void. Now, the EU accepts the normative proposition embodied in Article 53, but it fails to see its relevance to the present proceedings. My learned colleague has tried to rely on two considerations, the principle of self-determination and human rights, which he says has been violated. But it seems to us that in making his case, he has been required to stretch the law and the facts beyond breaking point. In the interest of time, I will summarize the EU's proposition position in three steps. First, as a general matter, for Article 53 to apply, there must be a clearly established conflict between two legal rules, and one of them must clearly qualify as peremptory in nature. In this case, we have heard Greece refer to self-determination and to human rights law in fairly general terms. And we say this is indicative. We are still not entirely clear where the violation lies. Second, in assessing whether a particular provision qualifies as a norm of use Kogan, the EU emphasizes that it's necessary to look beyond labels. The test throughout, imposed by Article 53, is whether a particular normative proposition is of such fundamental relevance that the international community of states as a whole, and I'm paraphrasing Article 53, posit it as non-derogable. And in light of the far-reaching consequence of Article 53, which, as we have heard, can invalidate whole treaties, this test is a strict one, and rightly so. In the present instance, the EU accepts that aspect of the principle of self-determination and particularly important human rights obligation can apply as use Corbyn's, but both categories, self-determination and human rights, are diverse categories. There is a massive difference between a rule against genocide and a rule requiring the provision of minimum standards of subsistence. As regards self-determination, it is indeed in the words of Article 53, accepted and recognized by the international community of states as a whole, that no derogation is permitted from prohibitions against alien and colonial domination. However, the principle of self-determination has a wide penumbra, and its penumbral aspects are much more controversial. Professor John Dugard, himself an ardent advocate, of the principle and anything but a formalist in international law made the point very clearly when he noted, and I'm quoting, that much of the support for the principle of self-determination as a legal right and peremptory norm is couched in generalizations and little attempt is made to define the content of the right with any precision. <laughs> and you agree with that position. It requires uh, that the case needs to be made in more precise terms. Now, third, coming to these potential, potentially precise terms, in the present instance, we see no conflict between the financial assistance agreements of August 2015 and rules of use corgans in the sense of Article 53. 
As for self-determination, we accept that in the agreement, Greece, uh, Greece has agreed to far-reaching <coughs> measures, but these, in our view, do not come near the core of the principle of self-determination. Many countries agree in international agreements to exercise their legislative and executive powers in a certain way. This often involves international oversight and very often international consultation. Dozens of countries around the world agree to financial oversight by international financial institutions. Others agree to have parts of their territory used by foreign forces. All this is based on treaties, and all these treaties, while often resisted by parts of the population, are valid, or at least have not been successfully invalidated. Now, my uh, part of the argument of Greece rests on the proposition that in this case, um, the Greek population expressed in a referendum its desire not to agree to an arrangement with its European partners. Um, in relation to this aspect, I would note that the EU is impressed by the openness and sincerity with which the Greek people during 2015 argued about the right course out of the crisis. With two elections, many parliamentary confidence votes and a referendum. We note, and I say this without holding myself uh, as an expert on Greek constitutional law, that under Greek law there is dispute about the legal relevance of referenda. Um, and this is one reason the EU states why we do not accept that one particular aspect of the Greek debate, such as the referendum of the early summer of 2015, should trump, let alone serve as a pretext to invalidate an agreement that was negotiated by the elected representatives of the Greek people that was endorsed in par the parliamentary process and that was subsequently affirmed in a general election. That is, in processes that are in place in Greece that are designed to actualize the right of self-determination within existing states. Mr. President, members of the tribunal, I appreciate much more could be said about Article 53. It's one of these provisions on which everyone feels they ought to say a lot and I will gladly explore matters in the next stages of these proceedings. But for now, let me restate the EU's position, which is straightforward. In our view, Greece has not made out anything approaching a plausible case on Article 53. Greece overstretches a purposefully narrow provision. And in emphasizing, as it has done more in the written than in the oral part of these proceedings, uh, in emphasizing one aspect of its, own, of its ongoing domestic debate, namely the referendum, it undersells the sincerity and breadth of the domestic discourse which the EU follows with admiration and interest. Mr. President, members of the tribunal, for all these reasons, we say that Greece's principal argument resulting in the invalidation of the financial assistance agreement of 2015 cannot be followed. Greece's claims must be rejected that those arguments, or sorry, those agreements are valid. Much more briefly, Mr. President, members of the tribunal, I now come to my second point, comment about what has been called Greece's subsidiary argument. Under this subsidiary argument, Greece accepts in principle the validity of the agreements concluded in August, but claims to be justified not to perform parts of these agreements. Now, of course, in order to make its subsidiary argument, Greece needs to identify a justification, a title allowing it to break a valid treaty. Necessity is one such title, which my colleague spoke to, and indeed it has now become a recognized ground for the non-performance of obligations. If such non-performance was necessary, was the only way to achieve a higher goal, this is what was discussed towards the end of my colleague's presentation. Since we're in Belgium, I might say that necessity has come a long way since the German Chancellor Bethmann Holbe invoked it to justify violations of Belgian neutrality in 1914. It is now, indeed, accepted in international law, yet it is the particular understanding of necessity that international law accepts, a consciously narrow one, one that ensures that necessity is not abusively invoked. Article 25 of the RLC's text on state responsibility reflects this narrow understanding and international jurisprudence confirms it. Article 25 and its predecessors, indeed, as the International Court of Justice formulated it in the Gaggi Corbo case, work under strictly defined conditions which must be cumulatively satisfied. 
an arbitral proceeding brought against Argentina, which equally faced an economic crisis, investment tribunals have had opportunity to further clarify the scope and limits of the necessity defense. In the Suez arbitration, one such tribunal clarified why indeed necessity ought to be construed narrowly. It noted that given the frequency, and I quote, given the frequency of crises and emergencies that nations large and small face, to allow them to escape their treaty obligations would threaten the very fabric of international law and indeed the stability of the system of international law. End of quote. Now, as regards the application of the necessity defense to the present case, I do not propose to test the tribunal's patience very much, especially as, in my view, matters are relatively straightforward. So permit me to simply identify two weaknesses of the Greek claim before I will briefly conclude my presentation on the question of countermeasures. First, it is justified to ask whether there has been a grave and imminent peril in the sense of Article 25. That was one question addressed to my Greek colleague from the bench, and the EU shares what we perceive to be the motivation in forming that question. According to the arbitral tribunal in the Enron case, a grave and eminent peril could only be taken to exist, and I quote, if the very existence of the state was compromised, a strict condition that, according to the Enron tribunal, was not met in the Argentina case of 2001. We may, of course, discuss, and this is a separate point, whether the Greek population faced a grave and imminent peril before the conclusion of the financial assistance agreements, but afterwards. Was not that agreement precisely aimed at saving Greece from economic collapse? And did it not succeed whether we agree with the measures or not in safeguarding the Greek state from safe and imminent peril over the past nine months? Can Greece really invoke the necessity defense now? Second, if we assume that the Greek crisis qualified as a grave and imminent peril, it seems crystal clear to me and to the EU that Greece contributed to that crisis. As a consequence, it's precluded from invoking the necessity to defense pursuant to Article 25, paragraph 2b. The President, uh, members of the Tribunal, we have much guidance from arbitral tribunals on the understanding of a contribution, and it leaves no doubt the choice of terms is relevant. For the necessity defense to be precluded, Greece must have uh, contributed to the crisis. It need not have caused it alone, a contribution is enough. And we say that there clearly is such contribution. We do not see anything in the pleadings of counsel opposite to, to, to dispute that proposition. Um, and that contribution is enough to preclude Greece from invoking necessity. Now, Mr. President, members of the tribunal, in the interest of time and procedural fairness, I will need to be very brief in dealing with Greece's further subsidiary argument based on countermeasures. Um, in essence, the EU says that Greece cannot rely on the doctrine of countermeasures and that the particular measures it seeks to take are not available to it as countermeasures. So permit me to summarize that broader point in three very concise steps. First, we struggle, even after the Greek pleading, to identify a breach, which is a precondition for countermeasures to operate. We are left to wonder what rights precisely have been violated. We hear reference to labels, but it seems to us that the financial assess assistance agreements of 2015 about which our case centers are anything but oblivious to the human rights of the Greek population. They expressly acknowledge, and I quote from the opening lines of these agreements, the need for social justice and fairness in the imp implementation of the package. The creation of a genuine social safety net the provision of technical assistance to provide access to healthcare for all and to roll out a social safety net based on guaranteed minimum incomes. Further details are provided in the agreement. No doubt the agreement involves tough choices, but we fail to see that it violates human rights. Secondly, more briefly, if it violated human rights, we wonder whether this is a violation that can be attributed to the European Union for which I speak. Council opposite made a case for attribution to the ESM, but we say that this is a strenuous case. We disagree with his analysis on uh, normative and effective attribution, 
and we feel that the, we disagree for reasons that he mentioned in his pleading. There's consultation between Greece and its partners about propositions. Um, there are clearly defined measures that need to be taken, but there's wide leeway offered to the Greek partners in the implementation of the package, and the agreement is very much emphatic that ownership, that the reform package must be owned by the Greek government. This is its key. This is the key difference in response to changes. A final point, much more briefly, if I may, and then I will resume. The EU argues that even if there had been a breach, and even if it could be attributed to the EU, then we would say that countermeasures are not validly available to Greece in response to the operation of this agreement. Under Article 52 of the ILC, the Articles on State, Responsible, uh, on State Responsibility, countermeasures must not affect um, operations, the operation of dispute settlement provisions. We work very briefly, and I will conclude on this, that both the ESM agreement uh, and the framework treaties envisage options for the adjustment of measures for the settlement of disputes. We say that the dispute, if there is one, about the human rights compatibility of these agreements ought to be solved within the framework provided by these agreements rather than by resorting to the archaic measure of the countermeasures. The President, members of the tribunal, law grows stronger if it's prudently reduced. We encourage this tribunal to apply the law prudently and to uphold the validity of the agreement reached after high-level and detailed negotiations in August 2015. Many thanks. Thank you, Mr. Gonsal. We are now ask you some question. Donc, Madame l'arbitre va vous poser quelques questions. Don't you think that um, the Pacta Sunt Servanda rule uh, could find its boundary in human rights and that uh, the um, MOU could be interpreted in accordance, uh, restrictively to be in accordance with human rights? Um, well, thank you, uh, arbitrators. Sort of in, in response, uh, we would say that the Pacta Sunt Servanda principle, which is at the heart of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, and international law project at large, I would say, has limits and has boundaries expressed within the Vienna Convention itself. I've spoken to some of these boundaries. And human rights, of course, are a factor in defining those boundaries. Human rights are a relevant factor in identifying the boundary drawn by corruption, are a factor uh, in identifying the boundary that deals with coercion through military force and are no doubt a factor in identifying the boundary to human rights, uh, sorry, to Pacta Sunt Servanda that flows from the operation of the Use Corbyn's principle. But we say that as a self-standing boundary, there is no such, we do not accept a rule that agreements were always, or could always be disapplied or invalidated where they touched upon human rights. Now I would reiterate that we do not accept that these agreements violate human rights. But as a normative proposition, we say that the boundaries to the Pacta Sunt Servanda rule flow from the Vienna Convention itself, as Article 42 clarifies expressly, and that human rights are an important consideration in applying those limitations to Pacta Sunt Servanda, but not an autonomous limitation to the Pacta Sunt Servanda principle. Thank you. Other questions? Um, going back to necessity, um, you talked about uh, Greece's eventual uh, contribution to its own situation. Um, you, talk, you mentioned the investment tribunal and the Argentina case laws. And in one case, Argentina was considered to have contributed to its own situation. In another, it wasn't considered to have contributed. So according to you, what would be the criteria to this contribution? Well, I think the, um, the criteria have been clearly worked out um, in, in the jurisprudence of arbitral tribunals, including investment tribunals. Now, you, you describe Maybe I, I may, if, if I may, sort of take issue with sort of your characterization. No doubt, there has been divergence of views in how to deal with the Argentine financial crisis. But I do not think we're facing a divergence of views which sort of would correspond to something like a 50-50 split. I do think, in all but two cases, tribunals have very clearly held that in Argentina, in severe economic conditions, 
such as those of early 2001, could not rely on the necessity defense. Now, true, and admittedly, they have taken different paths to what that solution, some holding that necessity was unavailable for, uh, because other, other sort of other exclusionary rules applied, some holding that contribution was a factor, others holding that there was no grave and imminent peril. Uh, so there has been a divergence of approaches or avenues. But I do think that in all but two cases, at the exit tribunal stage, we have seen an agreement on the result, namely that necessity could not successfully invoke by Argentina in a crisis that uh, was an acute one in early 2001. Um, now, I would add that in those two, or some would say three cases where tribunals came close to accepting that Argentina could invoke the necessity defense, their awards were annulled at the subsequent stage by exit annulment committees. So I do think while there is divergence as to the interpretation of the necessity defense in investment proceedings, um, I do not think there is divergence as to the outcome, which to us speaks a very clear language. Now, you asked about the particular question of contribution, and it just so happens that this was a section of my presentation which I would have loved to present to the arbitrators in my presentation in chief, but which I decided to cut for reasons of time, but maybe I can squeeze it in now. And I do think as regards contributions, there is pertinence to the analysis put forward by arbitral tribunals. And if I may, uh, I would simply read to the tribunal a passage from the award in the Inter Agua versus Argentina case, which to the EU seems to describe quite accurately the situation obtaining in many situations of economic crisis, which hardly ever are purely a matter for domestic policies or purely external policies, but which outline how such mixed situations are to be dealt with. And the tribunal had this to say. So it found, and I quote, that a combination of endogenous and exogenous factors contribute to the Argentine crisis at the beginning of the 21st century. Among Argentina's contributing factors to the crisis were excessive public spending, inefficient tax collection, delays in responding to the early signs of the crisis, insufficient efforts at developing an ex export market, and internal political dissension and problems inhibiting effective policy making. It listed those factors, and I'm sort of speaking now as counsel rather than quoting, the tribunal does not by any means suggest uh, to minimize substantial external factors. But it said that the relevance of those factors could not be disputed, and this was in itself sufficient to disapply or preclude Argentina from invoking the necessity. I do think we have fairly clear guidance from investment arbitrations dealing with the comparable situation of Argentina and how to handle questions of necessity and the particular problem of contribution to the necessity uh, that you refer to, um, Madame Arbitrator. Thank you, Mr. Gonsal. Other questions? Mm -hmm. no. That's all. Thank you. Uh, avant que le tribunal entende les répliques et dupliques des parties, uh, nous allons faire une pause de 10 minutes. La science est levée. Mesdames et Messieurs, le tribunal étudiant de règlement des différents internationaux. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the tribunal. Um, it is of great interest that I heard the opposing counsel's argument, um, um, and it is also with pleasure that I will respond to some of them starting indeed by his uh, reference to the governor of the Greek Central Bank, uh, Mr. Sturnaras, who is predicting recovery for 2016. For all his careful watching of the Greek internal debates, um, 
it uh, appears that counsel for the opposing side has um, somehow failed to notice that Governor Sturnaras is imposed by the EU. In fact, he was the previous Minister of Economic Affairs of Greece under the right-wing government of Neo Democratia, and he has been predicting recovery since 2012, none of which has materialized. Um, so much for this sort of arguments about the forthcoming recovery which Greece has been expecting for no less than six years under the very wise measures adopted in consultation, of course, with um, the EU um, institutions. I will not tire the tribunal very much, Mr. President, members of the tribunal. Um, I will be very brief uh, in responding to specific points being made by counsel, counsel for the opposing side. Um, the first, and I will um, split, split this in three parts, um, mirroring um, counsel for the opposing side's um, pleadings in response to my pleadings. Um, the first thing I would say is that with respect, with respect to impeaching the validity of the agreement and MOU, um, um, uh, because they have been procured uh, through coercion, through the threat or use of economic force. Um, Council for the opposing side quite rightly noted that this is reserved for exceptional situations. I imagine that the EU negotiates bailout agreements with states on the brink of collapse every couple of months. Um, however, I'm not aware of any of those uh, being sort of previously um, negotiated on um, such a scale with uh, a state whose um, current sovereign debt exceeds 340 billion euros. Um, so I'm sort of thinking that if this situation is really not exceptional, one must wonder what exactly is an exceptional situation in opposing counsel's view. Um, he also rightly noted some of the debate surrounding the interpretation of use threat or use of force um, under Article uh, 52 of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. Um, and he referred to the Vienna Conference, and he made a point out of saying that all attempts to explicitly broaden the ambit of the terms threat or use of force um, failed. Indeed, the specific amendment that was proposed to include the economic force um, was actually withdrawn, which is really right. He didn't actually mention why this was withdrawn. He only mentioned that this was withdrawn because otherwise it would jeopardize the conclusion of the convention. And indeed it would, because the powerful Western states simply said that if you put economic coercion in Article 52, we're simply not going to become parties to this convention. So as you see, this threat or use of political, economic, and various other types of force is indeed a vicious circle which constantly reiterates itself in these circumstances. In any event, the terms remain open and there for you to interpret. We don't doubt that the use of the terms indeed imply some sort of connection with that to two paragraph four of the UN Charter. And we've had a very long and arduous debate um, in international law about the terms under Article 2, Paragraph 4 of the UN Charter. Many of the reasons that the states that opposed economic coercion as a form of coercion, as a form of force, um, in the Vienna Conference, many of the reasons that they put forward was precisely these issues of precision. Um, that we can't be exactly sure what economic force relates to, and so on and so forth. And that may well be the case in the context of formulating a general rule which tribunals or the law interpreters um, need to apply in specific circumstances. But here we're not in the Vienna Conference. We're in front of a specific circumstance. And the situation is not imprecise at all. You have a situation which, as I mentioned in my plea, has consequences akin to those of an armed attack. The threat that Greece had faced in July and August 2015 was pretty much 
that of the complete collapse of the banking system and therefore of the state's economy and potentially the state itself. And so that is very precise, very specific. The relation to the consequences is also very precise and specific. And I would urge the tribunal to carefully consider, to the extent possible, the content of the terms as they are formulated in the Vienna Convention as it relates to customary international, as it reflects customary international law. <coughs> Excuse me. Mr. President, members of the tribunal, the uh, counsel for the opposing side mentioned that invalidity is a draconian consequence, um, and, and I do note with some pleasure uh, the reference to uh, Draco, uh, the Athenian lawmaker um, that gave his name to this type of measure. Um, that's because he punished everything with death. Um, he was then succeeded by Solon, a lawmaker who gave Athens its set of rules that took it through the golden century, 500 BC. And these rules, um, their idea was precisely that they are far more balanced. Um, so, invalidity may indeed be a draconian consequence, but it may be a justified draconian consequence for um, a violation or a conduct um, as problematic as that of coercion. Um, through the use of economic force. He's quite right, uh, counsel for the opposing side, that unlawfulness is not the same as invalidity, um, that they are different consequences to unlawful acts. Um, however, we do reiterate our pleading here before you that the proper consequence for economic force is the same as that of armed force when the two have the same effects, and that is the invalidity of the treaty. Indeed, a reference um, the Council's distinction was based on discussing 26-25, so the Friendly Relations Declaration, and the declaration after the Vienna Conference with respect to Article 52 of the Vienna Convention, and saying that what, they, what these particular instruments say is that um, economic, uh, force is coer uh, economic force is condemned, it is unlawful, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they lead to invalidity. The reason we refer to these documents um, in the pleading earlier was precisely to highlight that the whole concept of force in Article 52 is still open to interpretation. The debate is still there to be had. Um, the debate has been had to some extent. And, and it is now upon you, Mr. President, and members of the tribunal, to decide if economic force can indeed have, in some circumstances, the same consequences as armed force. And for that reason, should be considered as within the scope of Article 52 as this reflects customary international law. I will just make one further point um, on um, the um, on opposing counsel's point about the referendum and the actualization um, of the right to self-determination. Um, the counsel said that the referendum um, the outcome of the referendum was the Greek people's decision not to enter into an agreement with the European Union. And that is not at all the case. Um, the decision was not to enter into that particular agreement, tabled by the European Union, precisely for the reasons um, uh, put to you earlier. And that is essentially that it deprives Greece of any sovereign authority over its own domestic affairs. Um, that doesn't mean um, that the Greek people did not give the government a mandate to negotiate an agreement, but they gave it a mandate to negotiate a fair and equitable agreement in those circumstances, and to negotiate a fair and equitable agreement not against the threat of extinction of the state. I will now move to discussing um, the uh, issue of necessity. Uh, which counsel for the opposing side was kind enough um, to raise. Um, one of the pertinent questions that he rose with respect to grave and imminent peril uh, was that 
And this means that the very existence of the state is compromised, and he wondered whether can Greece can actually invoke necessity today. Um, and the answer is yes. The very same peril is still there today. As the negotiations are progressing with respect to the first review, which I'm sure you've heard of, um, and the first, the successful completion of the first review is um, the um, requirement for uh, the release of the next tranche of the money, which actually none of which actually goes to Greece, but it goes back to paying um, uh, the existing debt. Um, as the first review then looms, pressure by the European Union and the ESM organs is actually still mounting, precisely because the whole structure of both the Financial Assistance Facility Agreement and the MOU is to keep Greece under a constant stage or in state of necessity. The next threat for expulsion from the euro, for destruction of the Greek banks, is just one unsuccessful review away. And that never ceases, as it hasn't ceased since 2010. As for the contribution, and what kind of contribution on the part of Greece would be enough to preclude a defense of necessity, Council mentioned all sorts of Argentinian cases before um, arbitral tribunals. Um, Arbitrator Pno pointed out the divergence of views in her question to opposing counsel. Um, and I would basically urge the tribunal to disregard the completely incoherent um, uh, jurisprudence, if it may indeed be called so, of investment tribunals um, in the matter of Argentina, not only because of the divergent views, not only because many of these decisions have been annulled by annulment committees, but in particular also because um, um, in the context of the Argentinian arbitrations, um, even the tribunals themselves could not actually differentiate between the exception of necessity under a particular bilateral investment treaty and the defense of necessity under customary international law. Fudged the two together, disagreed as to what contribution to the um, state of necessity involves. And indeed, um, in the case or the excerpt read out uh, by my august colleague, um, argued that basically everything under the sun is a contribution to the injury going back to Adam and Eve. So um, everything including inability to properly collect taxes, but who knows for how many years, inability to in fact prepare yourself for outside, uh, for exports and grow your export markets, um, and so on and so forth. I mean, I leave it to you um, to um, assess to what extent anyone can come up with exposed factor justification with respect to contributions to the injury, uh, to the contributions to the state of necessity, and even argue that the warm climate and sunny weather of Greece indeed contributed to the injury by forcing many of the Greeks out for Uzo at 3 p.m. of a sunny afternoon. Um, but I will tell you this, the fact that between 2010 and 2016, the Greek state has been unable to conduct its own affairs because it has been under the constant oversight of EU, EFSF, or ESM institutions, pretty much precludes any contribution to the injury, any whatsoever, and I'm not talking about concession, um, uh, causation, I'm talking about simple contribution to the injury, for a state that didn't have actually any control. I will, I was hoping not to um, take so long to make these um, points. I would like to make quickly uh, two more points. Um, with, uh, with respect to countermeasures, um, I would make the following, um, uh, with the following point. I will only respond, I, I don't believe, I believe that I've set out my case um, properly as to why I think the measures taken by the Greek state are in fact attributable to the ESM and in breach of human rights obligations. I can only say to you that with respect to the point raised um, about the existence or the um, uh, sort of um, the fact that there is dispute uh, settlement available under the uh, financial um, uh, assistance facility agreement, 
I would point out that there is indeed dispute settlement available before the European courts. Um, that is essentially saying that one party must go to the courts of the other party to find justice. In fact, the ECJ itself has declared the European Union legal order as an ordre juridique hoc, and indeed later on even dropped um, the uh, qualification that this is a special legal order of international law. It's in fact a special legal order of itself. For this reason, the tribunal should treat it as the same as a domestic legal order and not consider the dispute settlement provisions in the agreement as actually offering dispute settlement provisions in accordance with Article 52 of the ILC Articles on State Responsibility. As such, they don't put countermeasures. In closing, I would say that I have to respond to my August colleague's point about the fact that this agreement um, required um, difficult choices on both sides. Um, and it required um, difficult compromises on both sides. And uh, no doubt it did, except we wouldn't expect to say that two sides, one with very nicely fitting couture Cambridge gowns and leather um, folders could be considered with someone who has borrowed the gown and a paper bag for his feelings. Thank you, Mr. Consul. Oh, sorry. There are questions. Uh, no questions. So no it's questions. Perfect. <laughs> it's perfect. So I anticipated that. Je vais donc passer maintenant la parole à Monsieur Christian Times pour la duplique de l'Union européenne. Mr. Council, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. President and members of the Tribunal. It's a pleasure to speak to you again for a brief, uh, a brief second round of presentations. I would like to address four points in relatively quick succession responding to um, the pleadings of the Council for Greece. I will first speak about the vicious circle that one is apparently engaged in in trying to make sense of Article 52 of the Vienna Convention. I will say a word about um, self-determination and the different views within Greece about the current situation. I will very briefly speak to the alleged incoherence of investment arbitral awards related to Argentina and the role that those may play in guiding this tribunal, and I will conclude with comments about the hardworking nature of the Greek population and its council. We need to borrow uh, folders in order to make pleadings before August tribunal. Now, the first point, the vicious circle. You heard just a moment ago uh, council opposite speak about the vicious circle that one was engaged in uh, in coming to terms with Article 52 because uh, a certain amendment table at Vienna had been vetoed by a small clique of powerful nations, apparently powerful enough to threaten the uh, majority from having its views, from uh, sort of blocking, blocking the adoption of a consensus that was uh, the, the correct one. Um, you have also heard uh, Council opposite speak about the particularly grave situation in Greece, which even if economic coercion is generally a, a widely defined term, uh, this particular instance would, would surely qualify as economic coercion of sufficient gravity to invalidate a treaty, draconian or Solonic, whatever we characterize the measure. Now, I think the what you, we could get from these comments, which were designed to assuage the tribunal's concerns about a potential um, vagueness of the notion of economic coercion. So I think a point is indeed right into the heart of the problems that uh, international law faces if it broadens notions or broad, broadens grown, uh, grounds for the invalidity of treaties. On economic coercion, we can debate at length whether this is a particular grave measure, whether this is specific or not, whether this is sort of concretized in the specific application. None of this addresses the argument that I was putting to you and to which the EU stands that precisely because it did not want to engage, or 
precisely because it did not want to engage with a gradual assessment of degrees of economic coercion, the international community in Vienna decided not to admit economic coercion as a ground for the impeachment of treaties. It restricted to this to the notion of military force. Um, we are in no disagreement, I'm glad to report, about the textual analysis, which clearly points towards the EU's position on this matter, um, which we have heard the Greek government uh, in almost sort of conceding the point, it maintains that the view is still open because a group of powerful states managed to block the adoption by consensus of a certain provision. Now, I'm, I was almost uh, thinking that is this going to be an argument leading to the invalidity of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties because a clique of powerful states was powerful enough to coerce the well-meaning majority from imposing, or rather imposing to strong a term, from using and uh, uh, using language in the convention that would reflect the majority's views was that again a clique of powerful states that precluded uh, the world from moving forward. I think it's precisely those arguments that Article 52 does not want to want us to engage in. This is why we say a clear view, looking at military force, is in line with the specific ban on force in Article 2.4, which is also construed as military force and which is true to the differentiation between invalidity and other forms of illegality, which can be addressed in other ways. Um, a final point, perhaps, oh no, I, I will leave it at this for the, for the first point I was trying to make. We've also heard a lot about um, the failures of previous Greek government, both in the pleading in chief and in the second round of pleadings, including by the current governor of the central bank who was part of that problematic group of individuals who lead, uh, who led Greek, uh, the Greek government until the fatal moment in January 2015 when uh, the true government was elected. I think what we see, whether it was expressed or as a subtext, is a reflection of the factional infighting going on about, uh, going on within Greece about the right cause forward. Different views are expressed. Some are more in favour of cooperation, some are less so. Within the government, some factions accept the need to cooperate with European partners to a greater degree than others. There are different assessments of the economic situation, there are just different assessments of the political situation. All we are saying, as the EU responding to this tribunal, is that this is not the province where international law reigns and dominates. We are not, as I said at the outset, making an argument about justiciability, of competence. Of course, this tribunal is competent to assess this case against the yardsticks of international law. But as is clear from Council Opposite's remark about different groupings within Greece, these are matters on which reasonable people can disagree. Whether the agreements concluded in August 2015 produce effects or not, we ought to leave to others to judge and to declare. Maybe we'll need more time to assess their effects. All we are saying at this stage is they do not reach the threshold, that they may have uh, sort of, uh, led to wrong choices being made on both sides. But the sharp divisions that we see within Greece and between Greece and its European partners point us to very uh, real room for disagreement. And we say that the law, which is based on the sanctity of treaties on the rule of Pacta Savanda, Pacta Sun Savanda, and which formulates narrow and specific exceptions to this rule, is ill-advised if it follows a particular economic analysis or a particular political analysis about the desirability of certain measures adopted in a treaty. The law is ill-advised and it overstretches, we overstretch our competence as international lawyers if we follow the particular fashion currently dominant in Greece as opposed to the particular fashion that was dominant until early 2015. We should stick to the text of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties and apply the law to reiterate myself on this point prudently. Much more, use, uh, much more briefly, we heard, or you heard, uh, Council opposite say that uh, investment arbitrations relating to Argentina were of no relevance to the present proceedings and of no guidance to this tribunal. Now, of course, as a matter of law, the EU concedes that your tribunal is not bound by what a particular investment tribunal has argued in a particular case in opposing a foreign investor and Argentina relating to a different crisis under a different uh, normative provision. 
but we do say that there is potentially persuasive authority to the holdings of investment arbitral tribunal as they grapple with precisely the same question, the invocation by a state of the state of necessity defense in a situation of economic and financial crisis, um, which was, could have been found to justify non-performance of obligations or could have been found not to justify such a non-performance. We do see in the Greek a decision not to even admit arguments drawing on the persuasive force of Argentine precedent, if I may call them that way, a certain Greek exceptionalism that its crisis is so particular that we must not admit arguments by precedent, by persuasive precedent, we must not admit, admit arguments that look at how different tribunals have dealt with different but similar situations. And we reject that exceptionalism more than anything else. We also reject the analysis put forward to you just a minute ago about the state of investment arbitration. There are dozens of investment arbitrations dealing with Argentina. It, you, was, you were told they were incoherent. I tried to make clear in response to a question put to me by the bench in the first round of pleadings that they are they adopt varied approaches as to the legal reasoning, but they are anything but incoherent. They are reasonably and very much coherent as to the outcome, namely that Argentina cannot successfully invoke the necessity defense or could not invoke the necessity defense with respect to measures taken in and around early 2001. Now, if I may, Greece has invented many things from democracy to philosophy and at least of European philosophy to Giros more recently. But it's not always the first. There are other, other countries have been in situations of crises and in dire straits before. And it may occasionally, even for Greek scholars, be useful to look elsewhere. No doubt the Greeks have invented the more relevant things. But in situations of crises, the Greece, Greece is not the first country to face economic meltdown and financial meltdown and to look to other crisis scenarios in which other tribunals have adjudicated and tried to make sense of the law as applied to context, sort of to difficult and complex sets of facts and, uh, and economics, uh, sort of different, different economic facts, uh, is no doubt useful and instructive, even though I would reiterate that you are, of course, a tribunal in your own right, with your own competence, you're not bound by what other tribunals have said, but we would say that the arbitrations coming out of the Argentine crisis are persuasive, instructive, and the coherent outcome that they have reached should be something that this tribunal should very carefully consider. A final point, um, which I will introduce by picking up comments made by my learned colleague at the outset of his first pleading and reiterated at the beginning of the second about the hard-working or not so hard-working nature of our Greek friends uh, as a general matter, ouzo drinking, partying at three o'clock in the morning, as he put it, as they are perceived to be. Now, I have no views on, on those things, um, but I would say that the European summit at which the agreements that we're talking about and whose fate we try to assess today was essentially brokered, the July summit um, in Brussels, uh, was the longest ever summit. It was certainly no question of not being hardworking for anybody involved in those summit negotiations, Greek or German or EU uh, personnel. Everyone was exhausted, as is clear from the statements made the morning after a deal had been reached. Many governments were weakened. Many perceived the Greek government to have been crushed. Others perceived the German government to have overplayed its cards and have been sort of lost, uh, lost support elsewhere. Maybe some of this resonates to this day in current European crisis debates. Maybe this is, has been more, more lo maybe this has, has had more long-term consequences than people anticipated at the time. And if I would turn things around, and I would say on a positive note, we certainly see that any perception of German-Greek antagonism within the European Union has been a matter of the time only. And we see those two countries very much aligned in other European crises that we're facing at the moment. And I would add that I'm very glad about that. Now, everybody was exhausted, everybody uh, made compromises, tough choices were made on both sides. Um, I think this in itself does not prejudge any outcome, of course, other than the fact that Greeks can be hard work um, and, should, and are not always universally portrayed as, as lacking that capacity. But I do think this points us already to a different assessment 
of the overall compromise than the one presented to you by our council opposite. And maybe in conclusion, or to build up towards my concluding sentence, permit me to read from an assessment by an observer who looked at the negotiations from afar, from the other side of the Atlantic, and who may, because of the uh, greater distance that he had, had uh, maybe sort of had a sharper eye. Now this is what Rob House, the famous international economic lawyer, wrote about the agreement. He said that, of course, on the face of it, the common reading was of a Greek surrender, but this reading, he said, and he said firmly, was entirely incorrect. So he noted that the tougher new conditions imposed on Greece by the bailout package, which in some sense, while in some sense a technical retreat by Mr. Tsipras, he said, so how says, they, these were couched in language that, on many points, such as privatization and review of collective bargaining, uh, leave ample room to execute measures in a manner consonant with progressive social and economic values. The means chosen to implement reforms is very much left open and presumptively in Greek hands, provided that the measures are ambitious and comprehensive, that the goals set by the, by the agenda are met. Now, Mr. Howes may be right or may be wrong. I'm not one to second guess it. All I'm pursuing in quoting this overall assessment of the negotiations is to question the reading that was put to you by Council Opposite, namely that this was essentially a surrender in which one strong party imposed upon a weak party a certain, uh, a certain defeat. Perceptions at the time were different, perceptions today are different. I would reiterate that as international lawyers trying to apply the letter of the law and the spirit of the law, we're well advised not to get embroiled in the discussions between political observers, pundits and economists. We're well advised to stick to the letter of the law and we find this law clearly expressed in the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties and in other documents to which I have made reference, the EU, in concluding, in concluding would uh, put its position to you that if prudently applied and in line with the canon of interpretation set out in the Vienna Convention, we see no reason, none at all, in fact, to invalidate the financial assistance agreements of August 2015, which were the product of a hard compromise, not unusual for international agreements negotiated under circumstances, and which set up a framework which allows Greece and its European partners to find ways out of the quagmire that Greece has found itself in. If we agree on the right way out of this quagmire, we may need to quote a, a scholar that is dear and close to the heart of my council opposite. We may need to rely on the expertise of others. Sometimes it is, as is often said, more useful to call the plumber, the pope, the priest, or others, or in this case the economist. The lawyers are not always the best peace people to seek guidance from. And international law, as is often said by the same scholar, still close to the heart of my council opposite, is not a Swiss army knife. It cannot do everything. In this case, we encourage the tribunal to be mindful of the strengths and the limits of international law to apply prudently and to, to reject the root claims. Many thanks. Thank you, Mr. Consul. I'm going to ask you some questions. Well, I mean, these factors would no doubt inform this tribunal's judgment as to whether it would seek guidance from uh, decisions rendered elsewhere. I do, well, the EU as, uh, is very much involved in the reform of the investment the system of investor state dispute resolution, as you are no doubt aware. The EU sees a lot of room for improvement in this respect, but I think even uh, conceding as much, the EU would not accept the reading that investment tribunals as a general matter are only or simply primarily concerned with investment protection. And I think we see this in the very many arbitrations that deal with Argentina, that we see in terms of the choice of arbitrators, arbitrators which, if I may, are almost as august as the members of this tribunal as general international lawyers and well-versed in international law beyond 
uh, investment protection rules. Um, we see, uh, of course, also in their engagement with uh, questions of necessity a certain learning effect over time. Remember, these are arbitrations which have begun in the early 2000s and which continue to this day. We see generations of investment arbitrators engaging with them. And what you describe may hold purchase for a particular moment in time or a particular tribunal, but we would not accept, even though we want to reform the investment state, investor state dispute settlement mechanism as the EU, we would not accept this as a general uh, characterization of the personnel involved in investment arbitration. Now, I think given the diversity of arbitrators involved in these decisions and the length over which they have been rendered, it is indicative that as to their outcome, they, speak one, they give one clear language, namely that necessity cannot be imposed. And we do say that clear answer is something that the tribunal should study carefully, not being bound by it, but uh, should draw inspiration from it. Many thanks. question about the self-determination. Uh, was it the sinning of uh, MOU despite the negative outcome of referendum, a breach of uh, self-determination? Thank you, Mr. Arbitrator. Uh, the, the short response to your question is that in the EU's view, it is not a breach of self-determination. It is not a breach for uh, a number of reasons to which partly I've tried to make reference in my first round of meetings and which I will maybe reiterate or accentuate. Now, we do think that um, self we, the EU is founded on the principle of self-determination of people. It espouses it and uh, supports this. But we reject the idea that there were only one way of expressing or actualizing the self-determination of people, even if we're conf uh, confining ourselves to the internal dimension of self-determination. And as I tried to make clear in the first round of the pleadings, the Greek debate is a model for how to deal with internal tensions and how to translate them into, uh, a, into a process that gives answers to, the or that, that reaches, that deals with the tough choices facing uh, the Greek government and the Greek population. Now in this case, as I was trying to say, we've had elections in January, we've had elections in the fall, we have had no confidence motions in Parliament, and we have had a referendum, and we have had an ongoing public debate, very public even between highly high-ranking ministers of, um, of the government as to which cause is the right one. Now, you have heard my colleagues speak about the specifics of the referendum and as I said in my first round, I'm not an expert on Greek constitutional law, but I note that there's even debate about the legal effects of such a referendum, whether it is binding under Greek constitutional law. Now, the point I was making was a more general one that even if we accept that the uh, referendum expressed a particular view in a binding matter as a matter of Greek constitutional law, we cannot ignore all these other actualizations of self-determination within Greece that we have seen in the course of 2015. And I, again, to reiterate, a further general election, an unsuccessful no-confidence mo uh, mo uh, motion in Parliament, the Greek government that negotiated these alleged surrenders has withstood in the political process in Greece in 2015, including in the referendum. I would make one final point because I realized that in my response so far, I've largely reiterated points that I made or tried to make, maybe make, didn't make clearly enough in the first round of the pleadings. I would say that um, in, uh, as regards the potential constitutionally binding effect, this is of course a matter that has occupied tribunals and scholars as well. If we assume that Constitution, under constitutional law, the referendum was binding, we might ask, would this not have effects on the validity of the treaty negotiated on the international plane? And I think in this respect, we have uh, quite ample support for the position that violations of constitutional proceedings or procedures for the negotiation of treaties in relation to the involvement of parliament or other expressions of self-determination do not in and of themselves invalidate a treaty. So I think we could while this is looking at the matter from the angle of Article 46 of the Vienna Convention rather than from the angle of Article 53 and self-determination, the EU would note that we can draw further support for our position from that uh, jurisprudence as well. I hope this answers your question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr.
ici nous amène donc Ceci nous amène donc à la fin de l'audience consacrée aux plaidoiries des partis. Le tribunal tient à remercier les conseils des partis pour l'assistance qu'ils ont apportée à ce tribunal pour leur exposer au vote. Le tribunal se retire à présent pour entamer sa délibération. Les partis seront informés à la date à laquelle le tribunal donnera lecture de sa sentence. Enfin, le tribunal aimerait, remercier, aimerait pardon, remercier M. Le Greffier, M. Vincent Chapeau, pour son dévouement plus que légendaire à ce tribunal, ainsi que toutes les personnes qui ont permis d'organiser cet événement. Merci. La séance est levée.